totally destitute, they look at their options. They even consider emigrating to Chile, where the government are offering land opportunities for emigrants, but Lily is totally against it. There's only one other option. Through his Scottish socialist friends, he's offered a job as organiser of a socialist club, the princely sum of one pound a week, where Dublin. In 1896, James and Lily returned to the city where they had first met. James was now a 28-year-old father of three with a fourth child on the way. He and Lily set up home in tenements just like this one, first in Charlemagne Street and then Pimlico. But the job that brought James back to the city only provided a tiny, irregular wage. Life was no better than it was in Edinburgh. At the beginning of the 20th century in Dublin, one in three people were living in tenements. Places like this teeming with children, teeming with noise. The doors left open all the time. Water sanitation was outside the room. Cooking was on the open fire. Mortality rates in these tenements for babies was the highest in all of Europe. The people who lived here would have been manual laborers, eking a living going from job to job. There was no stability. They'd walk down the docks, they'd walk carting or carrying up at the fish market, the fruit market, whatever work was to be come by. There was no social welfare. There was no unemployment benefit. There was no safety net. There was no help apart from the church or St. Vincent de Paul for people who were in dire, dire poverty. James was not only trying to make a living outside for his family and bringing home whatever he could, which is very, very, very meager. Uh, he was also trying to write here. He was trying to organize and try to spread an energy among people to try and better themselves. At this stage of his life, Connolly was no great political hero standing up for the downtrodden. He was the downtrodden. There was no money coming in. The family were constantly pawning possessions to stay afloat or to buy work clothes for James to get a day's labour. Once he even went to work with lily slippers tied to his feet with laces. Connolly's socialist principles and public organising were not helping him to get any work, so he had a lot of time on his hands. As an avid reader and self-taught scholar, he ended up spending a lot of that spare time reading, thinking and staying warm here in the National Library. In here are the origins of Connolly's unique thinking. When he arrived in Ireland, he was a committed socialist. But in here, he learned that republicanism and socialism were inextricably linked. And the only way to save the working man from his poverty and his slavery to the bosses was a workers' republic. Connolly read widely ancient Irish history, sociology and the development of human behaviour just to see if he could trace the natural origins of socialism to show that it wasn't just some intellectual invention. He could see socialist structures and the way the old Irish clan system worked across thousands of years of Irish history. He saw the ancient clan attitudes to land ownership as a kind of Celtic communism, and he believed this would make socialism connect to the ordinary Irish man or woman, to make it resonate with being Irish. Connolly hibernicised socialism. In international terms, that's what he's still highly regarded for to this day, taking a pure global theory and applying it to the needs, the realities and beliefs of people in one country, making it relevant to the working man. The young James Connolly took his political ideas to the next level. He helped form the Irish Socialist Republican Party and the manifesto he wrote was way ahead of its time. He called for the establishment of an Irish Socialist Republic. It's one page manifesto with some great lines that give you an insight into his thinking and his destiny. He wanted to nationalise the rail, children, free education and votes for women and that's in 1896. In fact, Connolly was an ardent feminist and a great friend of another feminist and revolutionary, Maud Gaughan. He once wrote that if a worker is a slave, then a woman is the slave of that slave. 
He was well ahead of his time in terms of women's rights and without him the mention of Irish women would never have made it into the 1916 proclamation. Having established his political party, Connolly's activism became more pronounced. In 1897, he and Maud Gaughan organised very public and provocative protests around the Jubilee celebrations for Queen Victoria. Not surprisingly, standing up for a workers' republic against the oppression of Victoria's empire did not go down too well. One of the stunts involved Connolly bringing a black coffin down Sackville Street with the words British Empire emblazoned on it. Faced with the police at the bridge here, he dumped the coffin into the Liffey. And as a result, he spent his first night at Her Majesty's Pleasure. He was 29 years of age. The following morning, Maud Gaughan brought him breakfast, bailed him out. The revolution in his head had just begun. Connolly may not have been working, but he certainly kept himself busy. He organised celebrations for the centenary of the 1798 rebellion. He stood for his seat on the council in Wood Quay, and he used skills learned in Scotland as a young printer's devil to publish his party's pamphlet, The Workers' Republic. Connolly's commitment and dedication. He not only wrote the pamphlets, he typeset them, printed them, and then went out and sold them. And he used the slogan from the French Revolution on the front of the Workers' Republic, the great appear great only because we are on our knees. Let us arise. The worst problem is he's still as poor as a tr because of his growing reputation as a campaigner and a protester. For Christmas 1900, as a father of five children, he managed to bring home just two shillings in wages. The family had no Christmas dinner or presents. On top of poverty and tenement squalor for the family came disillusionment. Despite his own unflinching commitment, James discovered that his party was floundering and subscriptions were being misappropriated into drinking dens. Connolly was on the brink. But in the beginning of 1902, the Socialist Labour Party of New York reprinted his pamphlet, Aaron's Hope, and it went down well. He was invited on a five-month speaking tour of the US, and within a year of that, he was emigrating for good. He said he had no wish to return to Ireland like a dog to his vomit. Lily said, if we go to America, we will never come back. We will not give them the chance to break your heart again. The American socialists who brought Connolly to the US wanted to encourage Irish American workers who saw socialism as godless and anti-Catholic to join the socialist movement. They needed a talented and persuasive public speaker who could connect with Irish Americans. Connolly fitted the bill perfectly. The location chosen for his first public engagement was one of the country's most prestigious venues, the Cooper Union in the heart. Here in New York, he was invited to speak. He wrote to a friend, the prospect sent a cold chill of nervousness up my spine. James Connolly was rattled. Of the 12 American presidents, from Lincoln to Clinton to Obama, that have spoken here, this is the most prestigious speaking venue in all of the United States. When Obama spoke here a few months ago, he lacerated Wall Street, story covered all over the world. James Connolly, 35 years of age, who came from nothing, self-taught, self-educated, was invited here to speak and address a gathering of New Yorkers. James Connolly stood up here and said, here, working class, and no doubt, as his speech went on, he ended with the words that he made famous. The great appear great, because we are on our knees. Let us arise. The speaking tour went well. After a brief return to Dublin, Connolly was back in the United States and eventually raised enough money from public speaking and selling pamphlets to send for Lily and the children to come and join him in the promised land. 
This was a new beginning, 